You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. Welcome back to TWIFO This Week in Futures Options. My name, of course, Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com, as well as from the network upon which all of you folks are binging. Hope you're having a good trading week out there. A couple things to remind you of right at the top of the show. First off, like what you hear, throw a like, a star, a comment. does help new people continue to discover the show. B, you should be discovering all the rest of our content yourselves. So make sure you're subscribed to the full network. And of course, if you want to go above and beyond, you want the full kit and caboodle, theoptionsinsider.com slash pro, the place to go to learn more. As we learn who's joining us on the old program today for our post-Thanksgiving extravaganza, I'm pleased to welcome back our old pal, Mr. Dan Gramza from Gramza Capital Management. Mr. Dan, welcome back to the show, sir. Well, thank you, sir. Great to be with you, Mark. Looking forward to exploring these markets today. Yes, explore we shall, listeners, as we kick off the Movers and Shakers report. It's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the Movers and Shakers Report. All right, everybody, welcome to the Movers and Shakers, the portion of the show where we do just that. We break down everything, lighting up the tape to the light side and to the dark side over there at CME Group this week. Mr. Dan, what do you think? I know you're still maybe a little bit full of tryptophan from the turkey last week. Nick, you can handle a little bit of light side and dark side for the folks, sir? My pleasure, Mark. All right, I'd have say, at it, sir. We'll start with the light side. You're Let's running the show. With, you pick wherever you want to go, sir. Okie doke. Well, then I'd say light side. It will start with number five. That was consumer discretionary sector. That was up 2.52%. Now, number four, technology sector up two. Oh, I said 25 
No, two. That's right. For consumer discretionary. Technology sector up 2.54%. Nikkei yen uh, up 2.94%. You might remember that it was number three to the dark side two weeks ago at minus 1.85%. Number two, which I thought would be number one, Bitcoin up 3.27%. It was number three to the light side two weeks ago at being up 11.46%. Number one to the light side, class three milk up 4.38%. So interesting list here and interesting market. I will say, Dan, if we ex tried to extend it two weeks back, before the holiday for Bitcoin, it kind of broke our system. <laughs> that didn't want to handle that move in Bitcoin. So we had to limit it to just this week, Dan, because the last two weeks, it has been a pretty impressive move out there. And of course, hitting 100K today. So you're right. It has been an impressive run in Bitcoin. So much so, sir, that it almost derailed our data for the episode. But I digress. Have at it. Yeah, you know, I could see that, Mark. It, it's just an unusual environment for a market to respond the way it has. And I guess we can talk more about that if you like. It, it's an interesting, uh, in an interesting position right now uh, when it comes to markets. Now, let's take a look at the dark side. Number five, utility sector down 2.72%. Number four, energy sector down 2.76%. And material sector, number three, is down 2.76%. The real estate sector down 2.97%. And that gas down 8.42%. Number one to the light side two weeks ago at being up 15.09%. So a bit of a change there for Nat Gas, but I think it's logical. But we'll talk more about that later. Indeed, we will, listeners. First, to the world of volatility we go. If you want to follow along with the CVOL movers and shakers, you can do so. Just type CME and CVOL into literally any browser that you're rocking. That'll get you to the CVOL dashboard. Uh, once you're there, make sure you set your high-low range to one week if you want to line up with the show. Of course, if you're listening a little bit down the road, you might want to play with that number a little bit. And then you want to make sure you're going for the aggregates tab. You can look at the individual if you like, but we're looking at aggregates here on the show. And I, I like a nice grouped list, but whatever floats your boat. And then once you do that, listeners, you're going to kick things off in the Treasury Yield Vol at the top of our list, also our largest aggregate C vol number at 110, pretty much even, up about a third of a point today and close to its low for the week. In fact, that's a theme we have for all of our C vols this week. They're pretty much all pinning the needle to the downside for the week from a vol perspective, including the treasury yield vol. Uh, the actual low was 109.69, so moving a little bit off that today. The high was 115.4. Then below it, we have the treasury price volatility, 6.39 kind of unched today and also at its low for the week. The high was 6.72 earlier this week. Below we have the ag products aggregate CVOL, 1706 when we're coming into the show, off about just 0.03 today. It's not a huge move today. Also at its low for the week, the high was 17.46. So not a huge range for ag vol this week. Below we have the metals CVOL, 16 and a half exactly off 0.1 today. Also at its low for the week, the high was 16.78. And then below it, we have the commodities aggregate CVOL, 33.2, off about a third of a point today. That's also the low for the week. The high was 36.78. So uh, giving up the ghost, about three and a half points out there in aggregate commodities vol this week. Below it, we have the energy CVOL, 54.52. Off about 0.43 today. That's also the low for the week. The high 62.03. At the bottom of our list, we have the FX aggregate CVOL 8.44. That's off 0.45 today. So they are annihilating FX vol today. And also on the week, the high was 9.28. The low coming right now. So if there's one trend in vol across the board this week, listeners, that's CME. It is that vol is coming in and coming in hard to kick off the show. Speaking of kicking off the show, Mr. Dan, 
We have a lot of potential starting points on the show this week. I mean, Nat Gas, one of our frequent offenders, we could always start in energy. Uh, you mentioned crypto. It has been moving a lot. I'm not sure if the options volume is there, but we could go find out. Or maybe something else is catching your eye, sir. Where should we start this week, Dan? That's a toughie. That's a toughie. Well, let's tell you what. You mentioned uh, Bitcoin, and I think it's interesting just from a broad market point of view what we're seeing there so far. So shall we start there? All right, sir. To the world of cryptocurrency, we go. It's time to explore the volatile world of Bitcoin, Ether, and more. It's time to talk about crypto. All right, listeners, let's kick things off in the wild world of crypto. Certainly rocking and rolling again these days. Bitcoin breaking the 100K. In fact, as we kicked off the show, it was north of it 101610 to be precise. If you want to find this for yourselves, type cmegroup.com slash twifo into your browser of choice. Uh, if you haven't done so already, they'll make you set up an account there. It's free, takes a couple of minutes. And so once you've done that, you have access, not just our reports, but everything they have cooking over there at CME Group. And then once you're in that drop down, listeners, go into the asset class. Go down just one slot. There's an alpha order list as well. And go into cryptocurrency. And then from there, you see product family. We're going to go indexes, Bitcoin. As also below it, you will see uh, the micro as well. I think for a lot of you, that might be the more salient product of the two. You know, whichever one you sink your teeth into this week. It's surprising because yet another record all-time high interest at Bitcoin hasn't been this high in quite some time. And yet looking at the big Bitcoin options, which is, of course, a 5x multiplier. So you're talking half a million dollars worth of notional value now, listeners, for a five lot. But only 847 of those changing hands this week. If we go to the micro, which is supposedly the bite size, the one that's more palatable for the retail audience... 1557 and again that's a much smaller contract as well so if you factor for the contract it's even smaller flow so yeah dan i don't know i don't know what it's going to take to really move the needle on these bitcoin options but that, that's a separate discussion we'll get there in a second first off i'm sure a lot of our listeners want to know what are your thoughts on these epic moves we're seeing in the crypto complex right now sir well, I find it interesting, and when I look at a market, I, I ask myself a couple different questions. Is the market we're looking at a supply and demand market? And some markets are, some markets aren't. This is an example of a market that is not a supply-demand issue. You know, if you look at corn, that could be a supply-demand issue. If you look at currencies, those aren't a supply-demand issue. Bitcoin is perception. So it's not supply and demand. Then what is the driver behind this? And we don't really have a good correlation, I believe, to other markets, although some people feel it's a substitute for gold or something else. But I, I don't think we've seen that relationship consistent over time. So I'm reluctant to, to think about that this way. But what do we have here that seems to be stimulating this market? And, and it seems to be two things. One, the incoming Trump administration is supposed to be friendly to this market. So that adds a boost that it's anticipating the future. Not necessarily today, but it's anticipating that future. And we saw it again when uh, Trump appointed, you know, Gessler's out. We got a new SEC uh, chairman coming in, and uh, he's supposed to be very friendly to Bitcoin, uh, to crypto in general. So that, I think, added this last spurt. But is it reality? No. So it's anticipating the future friendliness towards this market. What's also interesting is how we move today. Now, we had a move in the big contract that took us up to, uh, where was that? That was like 105, above 105,000. And right now we're around 101,000. So it, it did back off, and I find that kind of behavior 
uh, a market that could be taking some profit could be so far ahead of itself that people now sold into it. Uh, so I think that's what creates the setup that we're seeing right now price-wise in that market. So what about tomorrow? What about the future now price action that we should see in Bitcoin? I am not looking for an update tomorrow. I'd be very surprised if we have a new high going into the weekend. I'm looking for an inside type day tomorrow. And the reason is the market, <clears throat> excuse me, the enthusiasm's out there, but what's going to continue to drive it? If we have a new SEC chairman, okay, boom, the market takes off. Okay, then what now is going to continue to drive it? And I think we've seen a spot here where the market may need something new to now start making new highs. And I do not think that's going to be tomorrow. So I'm looking for an inside type day. I'm not looking for follow through in Bitcoin. So again, this is a market moving on perception. It needs something new to now respond to. Uh, it's got the friendly Trump administrations. It's got a friendly SEC. So we may be able to see other products being launched. That's what it's anticipating. And I think it's kind of done right now. So that's why I'm not looking for uh, new highs tomorrow in that market. So I think over the next couple of weeks, we could go sideways here. It has some references in place. And that 105 to the upside, uh, that's going to be a biggie to take out. And if it does take it out, we should close. We should be closing then around 107. That would be the next logical level you'd look for in that market. You're talking about Bitcoin, obviously, and that gets all the attention and all, all the regulatory heat out there. But a lot of people have been fixating on Ether, especially for the last few months as we've been seeing these these run-ups in the other assets like Bitcoin and even other ones like Solana. And yet Ether hasn't really played along. And they had a nice run over the past week and change, so they tried to do a little bit of catch-up out there. But outside of that, it's really kind of lagged the other major cryptocurrencies. I'm curious if, if you've noticed that as well and if you have any thoughts on the relative underperformance of Ether versus some of the other big crypto assets out there. Well, I, I think that's a great observation, Mark. And, uh, you know, the, the concept of these various coins that we have out there, uh, the, the expectation is, you know, rising tide brings up all the boats. And if Bitcoin takes off, it's going to drag these other currencies with it. And to invest in these other market, these other crypto, it, the cost could be less. So it should be more attractive because the capital requirements are less. Uh, we're just not seeing that. We're not seeing the response that you would expect in these other markets. So for Ether, I think it's in the same boat. It's responded the way it has, and that's kind of it. I'm looking for a sideways move in that market as well. It, it's a, a market that's moving on perception as well. So as we started out with this, uh, this is not a supply demand market like some of the other things that you and I look at where it is. Uh, that's not happening here. It's only what people believe is happening. And what and since we're looking at futures, it's the anticipation of the future, what's expected down the road. That's always built in to a futures market. And uh, I think it's behaving the way it should, really. The expectation would be higher. Uh, but right now, I just don't see it marching to the same beat of the drum at the same time that we're seeing here for Bitcoin. Let's see what kind of drum beat we are seeing out here in the options, such as it is, listeners. We'll start in the big Bitcoin options. Like we said, only about 850 on the tape this week, so not a ton to parse. 
Uh, the big dog, such as it is, about 10% of that going up in the 60 puts, a whopping 80, 86 going up this week. <laughs> All of that on Monday, pretty much, mostly opening. So 60,000 puts expiring in 21 days. We're at a 101 right now. It's probably not the thing the, the bulls want to hear out there, but there could be some overriding on these. Uh, there also was 60 of the 55,000 puts going up, so it could be a bit of a funky roll or ratio out there, even though it was opening on both. So, yeah, it's uh, interesting. That's really the only paper that went up this week was all on Monday. So not a lot going on today, even with the new record highs. And if you wanted a little bit longer term action out to, let's say, March, about 112 days, listeners, then you're going to get, looks like another put vertical also on Monday, also opening. It was the March 90,000, 70,000 put vertical seemingly going up 60 by 75 times. And that's all the OI pretty much on, on both of those strikes. So March 90,000, 70,000, again, that March futures at a 107, almost a 108 listener. So either way, you got some out of the money put slash put verticals going up out here. I don't know, you a buyer or a seller of those? I don't have prices in front of me here, listeners. But in general, the way the skew tends to set up in these crypto assets, the puts are not dramatically bid. So if you wanted to buy some downside, it usually isn't extremely expensive in fact let's look at the skew right now let's go out to march and the calls were 3.1 percent bid last week 6.4 percent bid this week makes sense we are continuing to rally out there the puts last week 1.4 percent bid this week 1.8 percent cheap so the puts are at a discount to the at the money vol which is hanging out at about a 61 right now so again you're not paying an enormous amount of any sort of premium at least for these puts it's pretty much the same deal on these DEES puts that expire in about 21 days. They're about 3% discounted to the at the money vol, which is at about a 58 in December. So that's the nice thing about these crypto assets. If you're looking to buy some protection, it isn't that expensive. If you're looking to sell puts to get in, you don't get rewarded as much. So that's the flip side of that, obviously. But uh, interesting games afoot out here in terms of Ether. Talking about the underperformance, that also continues in the options. Unfortunately, only 485 big ether options which i believe are a 50x multiplier only 485 of those going up this week ether right now 3890 as we're kicking off the show the 3400 puts also in december leading the dance going up 57 times this week most of that on wednesday 45 of them on wednesday all opening so looks like we got some more downside action 3400 isn't that far in the rear view mirror for eth so maybe makes a little more sense if you are feeling maybe a little bit bearish or maybe you just want to protect some of these runs we've had out here. It isn't the most expensive thing in the world. Well, worth noting, looks like we also maybe had a, a 3,000 puts going up closing on Wednesday. So maybe they were rolling from the 3,000 puts up to the 3,400 puts. They did that 35 by 45 times, so not quite one-to-one. -one, but if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, listeners, it's probably a put roll here. So rolling up to get a little bit tighter protection, that certainly makes a fair amount of sense out here. I wish I had some explosive paper for you to talk about out here, listeners, and for us to sink our teeth into here in the crypto complex for you. It's just not here. If you want more crypto, though, of course, check out the Crypto Rundown program every Monday where we get into all this fun, the SKU, the vol, the term structure, ETH, Bitcoin, Solana, all the major crypto assets, and a whole bunch more. But speaking of explosive things, I think it's time to head there, listeners. It is time to check out the explosive world of energy. It's time to tap into the deep options well of black gold, Texas tea, nat gas, and more. It's time to talk energy. All right, listeners, into the wild world of energy we go. Pop out of that cryptocurrency asset class in the drop down. Just go down one slot. It's easy to find to energy. Then in product family, we're going to skip past crude oil for now. Go down three slots to nat gas. Not Nat Gas CSO, not Nat Gas Global, just pure Nat Gas listeners, everyone's favorite out there. And coming in to start the show, as Dan was mentioning in our Movers and Shakers, which he did such an able job breaking down for you folks, uh, Nat Gas taking it on the chin and right around 308 to kick off the show, off about nearly 30 cents just this week or about 8.5%. Yeah, just a wild time out here, listeners, in terms of action. Uh, Dan, you know, that may surprise a lot of our listeners to hear Nat Gas taking it on the chin. We had a pretty cold November. I was just out there 
watching my son's football game last week. It was the coldest I've been in November in Chicago in quite some time. And yet, Natgas taking on the chin during what should be a seasonally strong month, Dan. What's afoot? Folks want to know. So what's going on in the world of Natgas? Well, it has been a bit chilly and a bit chilly out there right now. I was in the city yesterday and uh, I noticed the wind was really blowing. It went right through you. But then that would mean, you know, the old saying, if the, the if it's cold uh, in New York, uh, when traders would come into the the market, uh, then you expect nat gas and crude oil to go up. Or when it rains on LaSalle Street in Chicago, you expect uh, agricultural markets, the grains to go down. Uh, that isn't the case when it comes to nat gas in terms of what we're seeing. Uh, what we're seeing here is a market that we have a lot of nat gas. That's really what it comes down to. When you look at nat gas, there's three things you want to think about in terms of drivers of that market. And that's how it's used. You know, we we use a third of the supply to heat our homes and to cook our food. The northeast part of our country, uh, they use uh, still use heating oil. That's common up there for also heating. But the rest of the country, a little electricity, and we have um, – Nat gas. Another third goes for industrial uh, applications, steel industry, uh, chemical industry are large consumers, about a third of nat gas supply. And then the last third basically goes to generate electricity. In the United States, we generate more electricity with nat gas than we do with any other uh, source, uh, more than we do with coal. Although I should say there are some parts of the country where coal is so cheap compared to nat gas, utilities are still using coal. But the majority is nat gas. It burns 60% cleaner and it's readily available. And we've seen a number of utilities switch to nat gas. Well, okay, so that's consumption pattern and it is cold and we have more cold coming through, not only Chicago, but all the way through the East Coast. But we're not seeing the demand being built into this market because I still think the supply is there. Yes, it had a bit of a drawdown on inventory, a little more than expected today when they look at those numbers. But the market's not responding to it. We're not seeing evidence at these levels that buyers are here with both hands, which is what you would expect. It moved up a little bit today, but it also backed off. As fast as it went up, it went down. And today wasn't a screamer. It wasn't a really big day in terms of volatility. It's a market that's really setting itself up to go sideways. Tomorrow, I don't look for a big day up or down in that market. The bias, if you look at the overall structure, still favors downward movement in that market. So it's really, and, and the next challenge for it, it would be around 296, 296, 295 on the downside. We close below that, then technically this market's in a downtrend. And right now, the structure though, uh, that would be the bias to the downside. Because of today's action and yesterday's action, leaving shadows on both sides, it's what I call a neutral zone trade. So for tomorrow, I'm not looking for a big day. I'm looking for a sideways move, a little bit lower prices, but nothing to write home about. Not a really big move is expected in this market because I think the perception of what we're feeling, like this thing should be moving up, still kind of dampens some of that volatility. But if we take out these lows at 296, 
then you'd look for a pretty good size move to the downside, 293, 292, someplace in that range. So it's a it's a very interesting market, and this is where supply and demand does make a difference. And its outlook towards the future is what's befuddling us in the regard that we're not seeing the response you would expect. Let's see what kind of response we are seeing in the options, listeners. Is it a banger week for Nat Gas options? The answer is, yeah, it's pretty strong. It's not quite the 1 million contracts we've seen of late, but it's it's pretty strong, well north of what it used to be, 400, 450 this time of the week, up to 837 on the tape. So a pretty explosive week, again, pun intended, out here in Nat Gas. Of that, almost exactly half, 49.5% going up in the Jan contract that has about Looks like about 21 days to go here, so we're going to hang out out there. That future's at a 307, 308, as we said, to kick off the show. What is the vol in that gas, you might be wondering? And it was looking spicy. It was at about a 75. That's coming down now, listeners, down about 12 points this week to about a 63. So obviously still high, still higher than that level I was just quoting for Bitcoin, and usually it's Bitcoin and that gas that are vying for the volatility thrown on the show here each week. But uh, this week coming in quite a bit to a 63, but still frothy enough to take the top spot, at least for right now. In terms of skew listeners, looks like all the action is to the upside. The calls were nearly 10% bid last week, 9.7% bid. That, again, reflects that seasonality we typically see around this period and certainly into the Jan contract cycle for NatGas. That has come in a bit this week, down to about 5.7, so down about four points Uh, To the put side, the puts were 6.3% cheap last week. Not as much evolution there. They're still about 5.9% discounted. So even at these relatively lower levels here we're seeing, the puts are still cheap. Nobody wants them. The folks are still bidding up the call. So maybe we're about to hit some inflection point. I don't know. They were bid last week as well, and the the puts were offered, and we still managed to sell off 8.5%. So (laughs) the skew is not always the magical crystal ball, listeners. And in terms of... What folks are slinging out here this week, you probably could tell me if you've listened into this show for a while what it is. Yeah, it's the three puts in January as we're threatening this three strike. Three puts lighting it up to the tune of 42,000 contracts on the tape. The biggest day was Monday, 17,000 opening there, 12,000 on Tuesday also opening. Then we have 7,500 today against an OI of 41,000. So no surprise, a lot of OI on the even money three strike in January and then we have 5,000 on Wednesday slightly closing there so folks adding in quite a few three puts this week not exactly surprising if that's too close to the fire for you how about the two and three quarters puts trading about 42,000 times so just about 500 contracts less not even about 400 here for the two and three quarters puts and before you scream oh it's all rolls it doesn't really line up that way listeners the busiest day is actually Tuesday, about 13, almost 14,000 going up. I'm mostly opening there as well, so kind of hard to open on the threes and open on the two and three quarter puts on the same day and have it be a roll. Could be spreading action, but uh, doesn't seem like a roll. And then uh, we have about 9,100 going up on Monday, opening there as well. Closing again on Wednesday. So Wednesday was a big put close day, <laughs> 8,100 of the two and three quarter puts going up on Wednesday and nearly 11,000 today against an OI of 34,000. So does anyone's guess what they're up to today? Listeners think they're opening on these two and three quarters puts. These have 21 days to go, so not a ton of time, but we've seen that gas move more than that. I mean, it's off 28, almost 29 cents just this past week, so we could threaten that two and three quarter put strike in 21 days. Would you be a buyer or a seller of those puts at that strike out there, listeners? If you're looking for calls, you got to wait a little bit because the two half puts... We're also coming in the number three spot this week, listeners. 32,000 of those. Uh, the big day also Wednesday. A lot of folks closing puts on Wednesday. It's interesting. 11,300 of the two half puts also going the way of the Dodo on Wednesday. 8,300 today against an OI of 39,000. Tuesday about 8,000 as well, slightly opening there. And Monday about 4,700 again, slightly opening. If you're looking for calls, you got to wait to all the way to number four this week, listeners. 31,000 of the three half calls. Again, it's all Jan action this week. It's all anybody cared about. 31, almost 32,000 of the Jan three halves going up this week. 
The big day for those was Wednesday. So when everyone was bailing on the puts, looks like they were open on the three half calls to the tune of 11,381. 8,300 today against an OI of 22,000. 6,700 on Monday, slightly closing there. And 5,300 on Tuesday. So interesting strike selection here. Dan, any of these float in your boat out there? The three puts in December, obviously those are the closest. So you might like those the most or... Are you maybe more of a fan? I'm talking, obviously, buying premium here. Of the three mm. halves, any of these float in your boat, sir? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> not, the, the, not three, <laughs> the three is logical because of where we are. And I think fundamentally, too. So that that psychological number that we could look at here and with the markets responding to it. So that's kind of normal behavior. Uh, and then as you look out, the longer term outlook, when we think about the weather that we're seeing so far and we're just getting started. And if some of the inventory drawdown that we've seen, that may fuel, un, no pun intended, but it may fuel that upward move, uh, you know, latter part uh, of this week or uh, not this week. But I mean, next few weeks, we may see some movement to the upside. I'm not super bearish this market and I'm not super bullish this market. I'm really neutral. And it seems when you see something up for me, when I see something setting up that way, I'm more inclined to sell premium around it than I am to take a directional move. Well, speaking of directional moves, Dan, let's go out a little bit farther. Let's go all the way to February. I think you can handle that much distance, Dan. Mm, and yeah, let's check out. Got, yeah, please. We got a little I'm more upside. So if you were that. lukewarm on the three halves, allow me to present the February fours going up 15,000 times this week, so a lot of action there. 5,300 on Tuesday, mostly opening. 4,700 on Wednesday, slightly closing there. And then about 3,500 on Monday, opening. 1,300 today against an OI of 16,000. So February 4s, Dan. And before you chime in on those, if those are a little bit extreme for you, allow me to also present the February 10s, Dan. <laughs> they traded 10,196 10, times this week. Yes, the 10 strike calls, listeners. 5,700 of that on Monday, Dan, opening all of that opening. 3,600 on Tuesday, again opening. Only 800 on Wednesday, and then a goose egg today. So the OI on this strike is 23,600, Dan. So if it is a vertical, if it's a 410 vertical, first off, how much are you getting for those tens? Yeah. <laughs> and then B, yeah. it doesn't line up one to one at all. So I don't know, Dan. How does the how does the Feb ten strike? How does that suit you, sir? It, it mystifies me. <laughs> That's what I would say. I wow, that one. I have to. I love this. I really do, Mark. I I love what you share because, holy Toledo, what is somebody thinking out there? Even though you got a little bit of time, but that strike, and I'm trying to think of what could we be doing to justify that. I mean, for I mean, have we been there before? Let's do that. Is that an all-time high for nat gas? No. It we've been higher than that in the past. Okay. And in the amount of time we have between now and then, could we move seven dollars? Uh yes, we could for this market, but Nah, I don't see the fundamental support for that. You know, if we saw, I, I will say, oh, oh, how about this, Mark? How about this? Um, let's think about our friends in Europe. You know, we we send a lot of nat gas to Europe, and this that's a new variable we didn't have not that many years ago. So now we do have export capabilities. We go to Asia and we go to Europe. And if we think about the European situation, it seems that a lot of the supply in Europe has been fairly stable. Germany is saying they may be a little tight, but 
I think there's enough supply out there that we're seeing that holding its own. Uh, and when we think about Russia in terms of nat gas, you know, we've seen the shift in energy levels, and that is in terms of flow. Where is energy coming from and flowing to in Europe? And Russia really is not flowing to Europe anymore. Uh, a little bit actually is, but not to the great extent we had before. And, you know, Germany basically got almost all their nat gas from Russia when times of the relationship was better. But Russia is now shifting that export to other countries. And what's interesting about that is how they're doing it in terms of payment. We're seeing energy moving in ways that we didn't see in the past before the Russia invasion of Ukraine. And we're seeing it being transacted in other than the U.S. dollar. And that whole idea goes back to the 70s uh, with uh, Nixon and um, Saudi Arabia. And in the 70s, we had an issue with crude oil getting it. And we were getting it, almost all of it from Saudi Arabia. And we said, OK, he here's the deal. We'll buy from you and uh, uh, let's do it in dollars. And Saudi Arabia said, sure, we'll do it in dollars. Crude oil is priced in U.S. dollars as nat gas is. So now we have a currency play at work here. And when it comes to Russia and the BRIC countries, they're saying that doggone U.S. dollar, we're holding $300 billion of Russian asset because it was in dollars. And so Russia is saying to China and other countries, tell you what, how about if we do it in rubles? How about if we make a trade in, you know, yuan? Or how about if we use gold? So the central bank consumption of gold truly has changed over the last 10 years. And, uh, and we're seeing it in developing countries as well. So gold, they're thinking of, is a new medium of exchange to get away from the dollar. But it, it's interesting times when you add that dimension in there of where energy is coming from, the impact of the dollar on that energy. Uh, so it's an interesting, I would say, developing situation. But just one thing to keep in mind, are they now replacing the dollar in international trade? No. The U.S. dollar is still about 90% of all currency trades. So it's, it's still sitting there. The issue is it's easy to trade. It's liquid. You can get in and out if you're making transactions, if you're using U.S. dollar. To use another currency, to use gold, it, it's cumbersome. It's sticky. It's not easy. But yet, I think it's a consideration that in the back of our minds that we want to take into account. And I think it relates back to maybe what we're seeing here in these currencies. But you know, though, Mark, $10, I, I, I just find that very interesting and hard to believe. <laughs> While you were talking, Dan, I did some digging and I found prices for the fours. They were traded about 18 to 20 cents. So February four calls, 18, it's not, it's not nothing. It's not super expensive. So I guess if you wanted a flyer, I don't know if it's my favorite flyer, but it, it's something I could see an argument for maybe. I could not find anything on the tens, Dan. <laughs> I don't know how they went. Wow. Up. But I'm guessing that if they sold them, they didn't get much for them. And if they bought them as a flyer, they sure as hell didn't pay much for them. But also, why are you buying the tens? I mean, that's just, if that 10 strike comes to pass, Dan, we have many other problems uh, then maybe I should be buying some VIX uh, PARs or some other things to go along with it. <laughs> I, I think you're right. There may be some clues there uh, that we could look maybe at they got before really that happened. They got really concerned after the martial law earlier this week. They said, you know, I think that I think it's time for some NatGas 10s. I don't know what would be driving that, but uh, madness afoot. 
Damn, we, we've already almost done with the show. We've been having a lot of fun oh. here talking about stuff. Do you want to stay in energy, talk WTI for our final one, or you want to head somewhere else, sir? Gosh, that's a tough one because the, the stock indices, it seems like we should take a look at that. We could do crude very quickly if you want. All right, we do a quick stop in crude because it is top of mind. We just had uh, Kevin Green on the option block. He was talking about crude. We are hitting some important levels out there in WTI, so – Pop out of Nat Gas, listeners. Pop down to WTI, uh, 68 and about a half as we're kicking off the show. So obviously broken through the 70 handle yet again and starting to flirt with some interesting uh, numbers and some levels out there. OPEC, of course, coming out saying uh, they're not going to be be flooding the market anytime soon <laughs> with, with crude out there. So that helping to support things a little bit out there right now. In terms of action, 485,000 contracts on the tape in crude oil right now. So a, a pretty uh, pretty action-packed week, all things considered, even though we have seen it hotter out there. Of that, about 46% going up in the Jan contract. It has about 11 days to go. So near-dated paper, obviously a lot of it may be focused around what we're seeing with OPEC. The vol in WTI right now, 25 and a half, off about 4 bucks. So getting some of that OPEC event risk out of it there in terms of skew the puts last week 3.6 percent bid this week 4.9 percent bid and the calls uh two percent cheap last week this week nearly four percent cheap so nobody loving the upside and our most active contract out here it's the 70 calls in january so just about a buck and a half out of the money going up about nineteen thousand times this week uh, so that's your your big dog it's like trading back and forth opening the closing uh, pretty much every day this week uh, mr dan We've been talking about WTI and just crude for a while and the importance of these mid-60 strikes, 65 in particular. Some people saying, okay, if you start threatening that, then maybe the jig is up for crude in the near term. We're hanging out at 68 and a half right now. What's catching your eye in all things crude, sir? I, I think crude's doing what it should do. And it's a range-bound market. And I look for that to continue. Uh, we're seeing stability when it comes to geopolitical factors, uh, demand. This is that supply-demand situation. OPEC, we've been doing fine without OPEC changing their production. And I think they realize they're not getting the movement in crude that they were anticipating. They ideally want it to around $70 a barrel at a minimum uh, for them to have some profitability for some of those countries. So I think we're in that range. I mean, the the 66 to 73, $74, that's about where we've been for you know a couple months. And I don't see it changing anytime soon. So it, the $65 level is a strong reference that we've had now for a couple months ago. Uh, and if we did go below that, I I wouldn't look for it to fall out of bed with the behavior that we're seeing and with uh, the geopolitical factors that we're still under right now. Demand, supply, and where we are in our country in terms of production, um, it's fairly stable. And I think that's what the market's showing us. So I'm looking for a sideways move to continue that we're dealing with right now. All right, Mr. Dan, we got time for one more product, sir. Where should we make our final stop on the show? Think, this week? Hey, what do you think, Mark? Shall we take a peek at equities? I think they are very much top of mind. So to the world of equities, we go, listeners. It's time to explore the volatility swings, skew changes, and hot options trades in your favorite indices. It's time to talk equities. All right, listeners, let's keep our journey down this list going. We started in crypto, then we went one down to energy. Go one more slot down to equity indexes. Then we go product family US index E mini. Then it's just an embarrassment of riches from there. You can go SP, you can go NASDAQ, you can go Russell, whatever floats your boat. Mr. Dan, obviously, we've had quite the run post election uh, since you and I chatted on the great election night spectacular. It was pretty much exactly a month ago. Time flies, Mr. Dan. Wow. When uh, when the market's in rally home mode, <laughs> what's been catching your eye out there on the equity front these days? Well, I, I think a couple of things. First, I like what the Fed's doing. 
I, I, you know, Powell came out and said, you know something, the economy looks pretty good and things have slowed down a tad bit and um, wage pressures don't seem to be causing too much of a problem. Inflation may be heading where they want it. Their interest rate objective is around three and a half percent. That's supposed to be the magic number for the Fed, for them to reevaluate things. And when he came out recently, Recently and said, yeah, we're, we can be patient here. We can be cautious here. So everybody's going, oh, my gosh, is they going to lower the Fed funds rate in December or not? Come on. Well, they left that door open. And a lot of people feel that if they don't uh, this month, than they would in January. But I, I like to hear that they're not in a hurry to do that. I think that's a positive sign. The other part we're seeing here is anticipation. Anticipation of an administration change that appears so far that the market thinks may be healthy to the market. And so we're still seeing the separate momentum. The economy is hanging in there. I mean, tomorrow we're looking for some labor numbers to add some additional meaning to where our economy is and what the labor market looks like in our country. Uh, but so far, I think it's orderly. And could this momentum continue higher? Uh, yes, I think it can. We still have geopolitical factors out there that can happen at any moment in time, like we saw with South Korea having, you know, martial law for a few hours and what that did. Uh, and and that uncertainty for that type of event, if that would have stuck, could really be reflected in what we're seeing here. Because what we want to remember is that when we look at the S&P, for example, over 50% of its income comes offshore. So when people say, oh, no, I don't want to stay domestically with my companies and I'll invest in the S&P 500. Well, I got to tell you, you got international exposure, about 45% of their income. So it is important when we look at these markets, uh, especially on our stock indices. But right now it's positive. Today is very, relatively quiet. We didn't have any earth shattering information coming out for us. Uh, our trade gap has actually come down a bit. It's 73.8 billion. Uh, I found it interesting when we think about trade, uh, when our friends in the north, uh, uh, Trudeau, came down to visit with Trump. Um, you know, when Trump talked about the tariff issue, uh, Trudeau said, you're going to wreck my economy if you do that. And uh, Trump responded, well, you know, we have $100 billion of trade and you're, we're giving you that money, but we're not, it's not equal. And uh, so it, it's so in other words, he's saying, you know, you need to rip us off to maintain your economy. Uh, so it, it, that tension is still out there in that regard. And we're going to see it reflected here as well, too. Uh, but, you know, it's somewhat of a valid point. I, However, that being said, Canada is never going to be able to buy $100 billion worth of stuff from us. We buy more crude oil from them than any other country. We got the auto uh, issue that we buy from them, uh, auto parts that come from there. So that aside, going back to the S&P, uh, I'm positive on it. I do look for follow through. I think the next challenge we want to see going into this weekend would be a close above for the DEIS contract and the S&P, a close above, you know, 6120, uh, that range. Uh, that would be a positive sign going into the weekend that the market's willing to hold on to position. We saw some softness today, but no drama. Uh, it's relatively quiet. 
and people are again waiting for those numbers to get additional insight in terms of what the Fed may do. So I find the equity markets really interesting. That they are, sir. You know, just to mix things up, I'm looking here at the NASDAQ 100. We always talk, you know, S&P, sometimes small caps, but NASDAQ has been uh, outperforming a lot of late. Uh, doing decent numbers this week, 125,000. It shows you what relative volume level we're at, NASDAQ versus S&P. Obviously, S&P is going to be well into the millions. NASDAQ, not quite there yet. Uh, we're seeing a nice little run of... Obviously, options expiring today. We're at about 21,489 coming into this segment and 21,400 puts going up 2,400 times today. So, a lot of back and forth on near data stuff. But what caught my eye was going out a little bit farther out. We're going all the way out to uh, December. So, we're talking a whopping almost 15 days, uh, 14 and three quarters days uh, to be precise, listeners. And the 22,000 calls were lighting up this week to the tune of 1,700 contracts. Most of that was on Monday, nearly 1,000. Looks like somebody did a little bit of a roll-up, a house money roll on Monday, listeners, of the 21,500s up to the 22,000s. And, of course, 21,500s, pretty much the at-the-money strike there at that point. So they took those off about 350 times and put them back on again 950 times. So looks like a little bit of the old house money roll. And if it makes sense, if they were long NASDAQ 21,500 calls, and they roll them up, they're probably doing all right right now. So they're keeping that upside party alive here in NASDAQ, it looks like, listeners, to the tune of the 22,000 strike. So you're talking a little over 500 handles in about three weeks. It's a lot, but man, given what we've seen out here in this post-election rampage to the upside here, listeners, uh, nothing is too much. We also looks like saw a 21,500, 22,000 vertical going up about 500 times on Tuesday as well. And then a little bit of mixed paper throughout the rest of the week. So 1,700 total, the 22,000s traded this week. 1,500 of the 21,500s going up this week as well. Dan, does that float your boat? A 21,500, 22,000 vertical in NASDAQ with about 15 days to go? Or maybe just straight up buying the 22,000s? Sir, are you feeling that bullish in NASDAQ? Yeah. I am. The only thing about that would concern me, Mark, is when and how we get there. We don't want to do a vertical market. In other words, we don't want to get 22 out in a next couple of days. Could it do that? And the answer is yes, but I don't think it's healthy. Vertical moves that go straight up are very difficult to maintain for a market, including this one. So it'd be better if we do that gradually, getting up to 22,000. So how we move there, I think it's gonna be an important thing for us to monitor. Well, Mr. Dan, that music means we are done with our monitoring for today. How was it, sir? Did you enjoy your post-Turkey Day extravaganza? Always, Mark. Always. And I love those insights. What you just told us about the NASDAQ, it's very revealing. I, I really like that. No, I had a great time. It's wonderful to be with you. It's not all zero day all the time, Dan. There's a little bit more <laughs> to be found out. There's a lot of zero day to sift through. That's true. But uh, beyond that, <laughs> there's some fun to be had as well. And if folks want to have more fun with you outside of the show, Dan, where should they go? What should they do? Well, they can go to dangramza.com. Uh, it's a website that I have that I put a free daily video there uh, every day. The markets are open. Uh, and I select out of 22 markets of various markets to take a look at. There's an advanced video that goes through every market in more detail. But the free one, if you've never looked at futures, a place to begin is look at them. Take a peek at them, and that free video may just give you some insights in terms of how these markets move. You'll also see red and green lines, which represent buy and sell levels. These are not recommendations, just ideas that I'd like to share with you. So, And you could go back over 10 years to see what was I saying? How are these red and green lines moving uh, over time? So it's another reference tool that you may find helpful. Check him out, listeners. Dan Gramza, G-R-A-M-Z-A dot com. 
to learn more. And of course, you know where to go to learn more about all these markets we're talking about all the time, not just when you're listening to this show. You can check these reports in the middle of the night on the weekends if it floats your boat. CMEgroup.com slash Twifo is the place to go to kick the tires and light the fires. Also, check out the sea ball while you're there. A lot of interesting stuff going on there. That's going to do it for us on the network today. Back again tomorrow to talk all things vol with our buddy Dr. Bix and some special guests out there on Volatility Views. Then we're back one final time with some fun special guests to break down the world of unusual activity. Man, there's a lot to break down this week. Should be some fun trades out there. If you're not listening to Options Oddities, man, you're missing out. Check it out, optionsinsider.com slash pro to learn more. And we're back again next week all the way through to next Thursday, another episode of This Week in Futures Options. Stay safe out there, everybody. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com.